Hi, welcome back to Kingdom Portions. This week we're looking at Exodus chapter 10 through the middle part of chapter 13. We're going to be finishing out the plagues as the children of Israel are coming out of Egypt. We'll be looking at a unique focus on the ninth plague itself because it's so mysterious. We'll also be looking at how the children of Israel were instructed in the Feast of Unleavened Bread as well as Passover. We'll, look, we'll talk about the historical and future prophetic significance of both of those appointed times. It's going to be a great episode. Stick with us. Hi, Shabbat Shalom, and thank you for joining us here on Kingdom Portions on Kingdom in Context. I'm Sean Griffin, and I'm accompanied by my incredible and lovely co-host. Hey guys, I'm Lindsay. Shabbat Shalom. Shabbat Shalom, sweetie. Shabbat Shalom, babe. <laughs> thank you for joining us, guys. We're, we're excited about this portion because this particular one is, man, we get to finish out the plagues, and I've always been fascinated by the ninth plague of darkness, um, just because the unique nature of how it's described and how it didn't affect the Hebrews and I have so many questions. So <laughs> we're going to go yeah. through those kind of things, as well as, like I said, to um, discuss the Feast of Unleavened Bread and Passover and the significance, it's not just for the children of Israel as they were experiencing it, but the, the history of those things, as well as the future significance to the coming kingdom of God. We're, it's an exciting, exciting appointed times, um, which is why, in my opinion, it's no wonder the Father decided this would be the first of months yeah. with the Passover and the Feast of Unleavened Bread, that, that moment in time. Um, because it's just, man, it's, it's a fascinating for the renewal that's promised to us in the future. So, um, as always, we want to thank everyone for joining us. And if you're going to have any comments or questions, make sure to put them in the, in the, the box below the video so that we can try to address them as we have time in the coming week. And, um, and many people have asked us in the past how they can actually support us because they really are blessed by what we're doing or they feel fed by this ministry. Also, those links both for Patreon, PayPal, and even a P.O. Box for those who want to use regular mail. Uh, those are in the links below as well. As always, we just remind people that we're not Levites. So the whole concept here is we're not accepting any kind of tithe. Simply, it's the principle of Matthew 10, which Jesus sent out the disciples to preach the gospel of the kingdom of God, which is what we do here on this channel. And he told them not to take any money with them because if their message was blessing people, people would bless them out of generosity and hospitality. So that's the only principle we stand on, and we thank you for prayerfully considering it. All right, sweetie, any uh, anything before we get started? Uh, no, just make sure you like and share. That's definitely the best way to support us. <laughs> yeah, if this is your first time to see Kingdom in Context, we've got a, a, a lot of videos at this point. I mean, yeah. we've got probably over 100 videos, I think. I so. so go to the playlists on this channel on YouTube, and you can see the different types of videos that you want to view. And as always for this video, if you're watching, go ahead and click the, the like button and the subscribe if you're not already subscribed. And, uh, and that'll help us you know, grow the ministry as well. So we appreciate you. All right, so we're going to start out in Exodus chapter 10 and read through. Do you want to start or shall I? Yeah, I can start. Okay, thank you, sweetie. Then the Lord said to Moses, Go to Pharaoh, for I have hardened his heart and the heart of his servants, that I may perform these signs of mine among them. And that you may tell in the hearing of your son and of your grandson how I made a mockery of the Egyptians and how I performed my signs among them, that you may know that I am the Lord. Moses and Aaron went to Pharaoh and said to him, Thus says the Lord, the God of the Hebrews, How long will you refuse to humble yourself before me? Let my people go, that they may serve me. For if you refuse to let my people go, behold, tomorrow I will bring locusts into your territory. They shall cover the surface of the land so that no one will be able to see the land. They will also eat the rest of what has escaped, what is left to you from the hail. And they will eat every tree which sprouts for you out of the field. Then your houses shall be filled, and all the houses of your servants, and the houses of all the Egyptians, something which neither your fathers nor your grandfathers have seen, from the day that they came upon the earth until this day. And he turned and went out from Pharaoh. Pharaoh's servants said to him, How long will this man be a snare to us? Let the men go, that they may serve the Lord their God. Do you not realize that Egypt is destroyed? <clears throat> So Moses and Aaron were brought back to Pharaoh, and he said to them, Go, serve the Lord your God. Who are the ones that are going? Moses said, We shall go with our young and our old, with our sons and our daughters, with our flocks and our herds we shall go, but we must hold a feast to the Lord. <clears throat> then he said to them, Thus may the Lord be with you, if ever I let you and your little ones go. Take heed, for evil is in your mind. Not so. Go now, the men among you, and serve the Lord, for that is what you desire. So they were driven out from Pharaoh's presence. 
Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand over the land of Egypt for the locust, that they may come upon the land and each the land of Egypt and eat every plant of the land, even all that the hail has left. So Moses stretched out his staff over the land of Egypt, and the Lord directed an east wind on the land all that day and all that night. And when it was morning, the east wind brought the locusts. The locusts came up over all the land of Egypt and settled in all the territory of Egypt. They were very numerous. There had never been so many locusts, nor would there be so many again. For they covered the surface of the whole land, so that the land was darkened, and they ate every plant of the land and all the fruit of the trees that the hail had left. Thus nothing green was left on tree or plant of the field through all the land of Egypt. Then Pharaoh hurriedly called for Moses and Aaron, and he said, I have sinned against the Lord your God and against you. Now, therefore, please forgive my sin only this month, this once, and make supplication to the Lord your God that he would only remove his death from me. He went out from Pharaoh and made supplication to the Lord. So the Lord shifted the wind to a very strong west wind, which took up the locusts and drove them into the Red Sea. Not one locust was left in all the territory of Egypt. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go. Then the Lord said to Moses, Stretch out your hand toward the sky, that there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, even a darkness which may be felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward the sky, and there was thick darkness in all the land of Egypt for three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from his place for three days, but all the sons of Israel had light in their dwellings. Then Pharaoh called to Moses and said, Go, serve the Lord. Only let your flocks and your herds be detained. Even your little ones may go with you. But Moses said, You must also let us have sacrifices and burnt offerings, that we may sacrifice them to the Lord our God. Therefore our livestock too shall go with us. Not a hoof shall be left behind, for we shall take some of them to serve the Lord our God. And until we arrive there, we ourselves do not know with what we shall serve the Lord. But the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he was not willing to let them go. Then Pharaoh said to him, Get away from me. Beware, do not see my face again, for in the day you see my face, you shall die. Moses said, You are right. I shall never see your face again. <clears throat> All right, thanks, sweetie. Sure. Well... The plot thickens, right? Yeah. More, more back and forth, more wishy-washy. Um, man, it's it's interesting how I love like in the first verse where Yahweh tells him like I'm doing this, this whole back and forth between you and Pharaoh, so that I can make them see my wonders and my right. signs, you know, because he's not only establishing himself to the Hebrews, right. but also to the Egyptians, right. and that's just you know he has a he has a plan for because he knows how they're going to react anyway. But he's using that that behavior to establish, you know, some respect. Yeah. Right. To put some respect on his name. Right. Yeah. So it's just kind of interesting that um, that he's using this process to do that. What stuck out to you in this chapter? Um, I mean, well, obviously we have his own servant saying, "Can you not see that Egypt is destroyed?" Like, yeah. so Pharaoh clearly is, you know, not in his right mind and hasn't been this whole time. Um, and what he's doing here, it looks like, is playing this game of trying to let them go but still hold on to some control that's right because he's telling them first he's, he's telling them oh you can leave just the men you, you leave your your little ones and your women here that doesn't work then the locusts come up on the land then he's like okay well you can go with your little ones but don't take the livestock right like and so which is what they needed for the sacrifice right right and there doesn't seem to be any good reason for him to be doing that other than, you know, possibly they need the, <laughs> they need the livestock after all the other yeah. plagues. But really, I think what's going on here is Pharaoh is just, it's a control tactic. Right. He's just trying to maintain control. Because we already saw this in chapter 8, remember, right. where he said, well, you can do your sacrifices. Just do them in yes. the land of Goshen. Just yeah. do them where you are. You don't have to leave. Yeah. And, you know, <clears throat> Moses reminded him that would be against Egyptian law. They right. would stone us for that. Right. So that's um, so basically he's trying to find a loophole, mm -hmm. but at the same time remain in safe face and save some sort of control. And that's just more more evidence to his pride, right? right? To his stubbornness and his stiff-neckedness. Um, so a darkness in verse 21. A darkness that can be felt. Yeah, so I do not know plague. what that means. <laughs> I mean, obviously everyone, locusts come up and it's thick. You know, we, we've talked about how um, you said in your life you've seen an actual locust swarm. Yeah, I'm pretty sure it's, I can't remember if it's every 13 years or every 17 years, but every such and such years mm -hmm. they, they do come up to mate in certain areas of the world. And when I, I grew up in Ohio originally and my grandparents have a huge farmland out there and yeah, one year I was there when the locusts came up, and I mean, it, 
that there you couldn't drive on any of the property. I mean, the trees were black and and moving, mm -hmm. and it was almost like probably knee deep uh, in certain parts of the property. It wasn't the entire you know right. they didn't cover the whole town or anything. But in certain parts of the property, it was like knee deep in locusts, and it was definitely a sight to behold. And so, having actually witnessed that in real life, and, and then, then reading this for this to say that the locusts covered the land of Egypt everywhere in their houses and their, I just you know, like I <laughs> yeah. I think about the one time I saw that, and oh man, I couldn't imagine if that had been covering our entire town. Right. I don't know how we would recover from that. Because <laughs> they eat everything as exactly. The same, yeah. Know? So they're just. <laughs> chewing every possible last bit of produce and food that they, they would have had. So this is a big deal. Um, but then, of course, the darkness happens, right? right? Because what Moses goes and intercedes again mm -hmm. for Pharaoh to get yeah. the locusts to leave. It's very nice of him. <laughs> very, very, very loving of Moses to do this. Um, but, of course, Pharaoh's heart is not true and genuine, so he relents again. And then the father has to send this darkness upon him, right. which, is, which just was in the households of the Egyptians. Now, my question is, what is a darkness that can be felt, yeah. but you can't even light a candle? Right. You know, where it says that the Egyptians didn't move. You know I mean? And to the point where clearly the Israelites had light in That's the darkness, right. which I love as this, you know, prophetic um, foreshadowing yeah. of our the light of our Savior. But for them to have light in their households and that light doesn't illuminate for the Egyptians. That's right. I don't it know defies, how that works. It defies physics. Yeah. So it's not just saying, oh, they lived in a different place. Yeah. So therefore they had light over there, but there was darkness over the land of Egypt. No, no. It's very specific that in the households of the Egyptians living around the Hebrews, they had darkness, a darkness that was so somehow thick, so strong, so real that it was felt that they didn't even move. Yeah. <laughs> and that, you know, imagine they were terrified, right? Yeah. Because think about it, like when you just turn all the lights out and you can't see even your hand in front of your face. We're okay with that. Like, for the yeah. most part, you'll be okay because, you know, you can always walk over and turn the light on, right? But imagine if you couldn't. Yeah. Just think about that for 20 minutes, now 30 minutes, and suddenly your mind starts to change because you can hear things, but you can't see anything. Right. And you can't even see to move. I don't know. It's just wild to me. So it's almost like I'm imagining they, they fed themselves. I'm imagining somehow, like, they felt around the house and then, like, grabbed some food. I could be wrong. Yeah. Did they just kind of, was it like a weird paralysis? Is that what it's talking about, which, which is a darkness they could they could feel? It's hard to say, um, but I just think it's the most fascinating of all the plagues because I've never seen anything else like this in Scripture. Right. Going forward or behind, you know, Exodus, there's nothing, there's no other judgment that, that the Father brings on a nation that's specifically like this one, not even on the Day of the Lord. Right. And I've done extensive study on the Day of the Lord. We used to do an entire show every week on, a, on a, you know, an associate channel that um, was all about the Day of the Lord. Yeah. And we just broke down the Day of the Lord and all the different component pieces that happened on the Day of the Lord and why and all the characters involved. And, and never did we find anything that talks about this kind of plague being repeated in the future. So it's a very unique moment here in Scripture. And I just I think it's fascinating. So if you're watching, if you have any any further research about this particular plague or, you know, if you think you know what it was or what, it, you know, how it happened, make sure to put that in the comments because we'd love to hear from you. Yeah, the only thing that pops up for me when I hear the term of darkness can be felt, it just takes me back to when I was in my occult days when, you know, I was doing all kinds of the secret arts that these Egyptians do and there was a lot of darkness I could feel that I didn't realize at the time. Um, it felt wrong at the time, but I wasn't like intellectually letting that sink into my mind. But that's the only thing that pops up for me is... It wasn't actual physical darkness. It was just, you know, a bad presence I allowed into my life. Right. So I can't, you know, I can't picture what's going on here where it's actual an actual physical darkness that can also be felt. Which no light can even Which no penetrate. light can penetrate. Yeah. And we see that the day of the Lord is called a day of darkness. Mm -hmm. And we see... Zephaniah 1 talks about thick clouds covering right? darkness. And right. And we see darkness coming... Um, at the time of Yeshua's crucifixion, mm -hmm. but still, neither of those darknesses are described like this. So right. it is, it's interesting. If anyone has, you know, cool studies on that, definitely let us know. And if there's anything you saw in this chapter that you find interesting, intriguing, symbolic, you know, uh, just something you think we missed, go ahead and drop it in the comments for us. Yeah, absolutely. So. Um, do you want me to read 11? Yeah, go ahead. Okay. Yeah, you get the short chapter. <laughs> Chapter 11. Now the Lord said to Moses, One more plague I will bring on Pharaoh and on Egypt. After that he will let you go from here. When he lets you go, he will surely drive you out from here completely. 
Speak now in the hearing of the people, that each man ask from his neighbor and each woman from her neighbor for articles of silver and articles of gold. The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Furthermore, the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. Moses said, Thus says the Lord, About midnight I am going out into the midst of the Egypt, and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die, from the firstborn of the Pharaoh who sits on his throne, even to the firstborn of the slave girl who is behind the millstones, all the firstborn of the cattle as well. Moreover, there shall be a great cry in all the land of Egypt, such as there has not been before, and such as shall never be again. But against any of the sons of Israel a dog will not even bark, whether against man or beast, that you may understand how the Lord makes a distinction between Egypt and Israel. All these your servants will come down to me, excuse me. All these your servants will come down to me and bow themselves before me, saying, Go out, you and all the people who follow you, and after that I will go out. And he went out from Pharaoh in hot anger. Then the Lord said to Moses, Pharaoh will not listen to you, so that my wonders will be multiplied in the land of Egypt. Moses and Aaron performed all these wonders before Pharaoh. Yet the Lord hardened Pharaoh's heart, and he did not let the sons of Israel go out of his land. Okay. So we see kind of a reiteration um, of this same process again. Pharaoh's still got a hardened heart. Um, and there's a, a kind of a a forecast of doom, right? right? For the firstborn animals and children of, e- of e- the Egyptians yeah. that they're going to perish. Interesting point of note here I just want to bring up because we've talked about this, I believe, in the not just the last two episodes, but many episodes here in Kingdom and Portions. We want people to truly research the idea of agency, okay? This is a, in Hebrew, it's called shalak. It's, it's a term for God sending his angels or his prophets or his priests or whatever as his mouthpiece, as a messenger of his message, he implore, employs them with agency. He trusts them with his message because of their obedience and their heart. So when we read verses like this in verse 5 or verse 6, excuse me, verse 4, it says, Moses said, thus says the Lord, about midnight, I am going out into the midst of Egypt and all the firstborn in the land of Egypt shall die. So is Yahweh literally coming down to the earth and going to go into the cities of Egypt and smite all their firstborn, Yahweh himself, literally Yahweh himself. Is that what we think that this is saying? No. Obviously, no. No, <laughs> no because no man has seen the Father. He doesn't, and, I mean, he, people would die, right? Yeah. He can't come down in this, in this present. He sends his angels <clears throat> to do his stuff. But he gets the credit and the blame or whatever you want to call it. He gets all the attention from the actions that are happening on his behalf. So this is why he can make statements like this. And he can say, I am Yahweh, your salvation, right? Isaiah 42. Yet he does it through his Messiah, through his son that he sends to the earth in in flesh. So this is the whole concept of agency. He's using his angels all throughout this story with Exodus. We covered this, I believe, in the last two two episodes about the burning bush. Definitely in chapter 3. Yeah, chapter 3 It's unavoidable there. And I'm actually going to put a little video. uh, It's one of my morning cups of context. It's called No One's Heard the Father. And we've recommended this video several times before because it's important. I go through all these verses and, and many other verses, not just with the Exodus, but many other verses in Scripture, uh, even into the you know the New Testament, the Gospels, where the Father is using agency. Jesus is explaining agency. Paul is explaining agency. See what I'm saying? So there's uh, this one's called No One's Heard the Father. I'm going to put it up on the screen here for you. Go check that video out after you, after you watch this one because it will really help you understand what we're reading when we see passages like this. In Exodus chapter 11, verses 4 and 5. Um, what stuck out to you, sweetie? Well, um, here in verse 3, it says, The Lord gave the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians. Furthermore, the man Moses himself was greatly esteemed in the land of Egypt, both in the sight of Pharaoh's servants and in the sight of the people. So we have a, a drastic shift here for Moses. Because right. if you guys have, you know, if, you st- if you've been on our portions, you will know couple episodes back, you know, we talked about Moses was having kind of a rough go with how the Egyptians were treating him and then also how his own Hebrew brethren were treating him. Um, He goes away for a long time. All the people who wanted to murder him were dead. And the father said, okay, you can go back. But at this point in time, even then, we still, right at the beginning, he still had to prove himself to the Hebrews. He's clearly going back and forth with the Egyptians. And I think at this point, Pharaoh's servants, at least, are finally seeing the power that's coming through Moses from his God. And 
he, he's basically, he, he's not where he was at the beginning of the book when we start right. reading about his social status with his own people as well as the people of Egypt. Yeah. So, because remember last week we saw some of the plagues about the uh, boils. Right. He grabbed the ashes and threw them in the air, and then the boils broke out on the magicians of Pharaoh and his right. servants and his counselors. And so, yeah, this is all culminating and yeah. changing their minds yeah. too. Like, whoa, whoa, this Moses guy, which would make sense if they're also in the ear of Pharaoh saying, respect him or don't respect him, right? right. Listen to him or don't let him go or don't let him go. You know what I'm saying? So, we understand that Pharaoh has a stiff neck and he's got a hardened heart, but these counselors are mentioned multiple times in the story as having his ear. That's why they're all kings have yeah. counselors to them, right? And so this is where um, he's earning respect, you know, yeah. even from the enemies, which is fascinating. But what's sad though is yes, he's earning respect in the eyes of the Hebrews, therefore they follow him out in that moment. But we're gonna read in portions later. How quickly they lose that respect for him. Yeah. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Which yeah. is, just breaks my heart because, like, he's proven himself to be faithful to the Lord, to do all these wonderful things through, yeah. to be good, to be sacrificing his life for the people, right? In a sense, not like Yeshua did on the cross, but in a sense of going to Pharaoh, right? And trying to, you know, put his life on the line to actually go and re- be the deliverer of these people at yeah. this point in history. And they just don't respect him. He's you sacrificing know? his sanity, that's for that's sure. Yeah. <laughs> I think it's, all of us know. <laughs> we, yeah, we joked, uh, I think, last week or the week before about we need to make sure it's to say poor Moses. Yeah. <laughs> because that man definitely had some patience with yeah. these people that were stiff-necked, that in one moment loved him and the next moment wanted to overthrow yeah. him and set up their own ruler or wanted to go back to Egypt and didn't yeah. appreciate anything he did. You know what I'm saying? And like, I mean, geez, give us the patience <laughs> of Moses, man, because that's yeah. he was just so loving. Um, yes, he got mad. Yes, he made his own mistakes, but ultimately he didn't abandon them. Yeah, you know, look, he I'm even sorry. interceded for them in Exodus 32. We're going to see about that later. You know, I know we we all know each you know character flaw that the big patriarchs you know had, um, but man, I'm sorry, I, I I identify with Moses, and I just think to myself, man, trying to lead two million some people who are whining and moaning and complaining and and rebelling the next minute and then, you know, making false idols and stuff like that. Like, it's actually impressive that he only broke the the one set of tablets. You know, it's actually impressive that he didn't have more of a temper. Honestly, I don't think I would ever have the patience for something like that. We're going to read about that in future episodes, even to where his father-in-law Jethro shows up in chapter 18 and sees the stress Moses is under having to deal with these people. And he says, hey, you need to start delegating your authority in this judgeship and start setting up elders and appoint other judges so they can hear some of these cases and not, you know, and some of these complaints and things. Because that's just the natural sociological outcome when you've got a large group of people together. Some are going to complain. Some are going to be okay. Some are going to be cheerleaders for you, like Joshua and Caleb and the 70 elders and, you know. But there's always going to be dissenters. There's going to be people that want mutiny. There's going to be people that, regardless of what you say, they're going to try to, you know, overthrow you or disrespect you or, you know what I mean? So this just the this is what happens when you get large groups of people together. It's yeah. just a it's just what happens. Yeah. Um, not everyone's heart is is towards the idea of unity, you know? And so this is what Moses has to deal with continually. And it's just, it's sad. So Jethro even sees this later and he's going to have to help Moses with this delegation. Yeah. Um, all right. Verse 7 actually was something that I wanted to point out because I think it's interesting that he says, making a distinction between you and the Egyptians. Right. Um, So he's telling them that when this all goes down and all these firstborn are smited and you guys are leaving, not only are they going to give you all their gold and silver or whatever, but they're going to not mess with you on the way out because of the great calamity that's about to come on them. Not even a dog is going to bark at you on your way out, right? Which, you know, I mean, that's kind of a, a unique uh, a unique extent of a description to try to explain because dogs are loyal to their masters, mm-hmm. right? And if their master doesn't like you, their dog picks up on that. So what it, this is just in the extent of explaining to them how even the Egyptians will say, go, yeah. <laughs> in humility, right? Because they have literally, and I, I don't always use this term because it's taken out of context so much, but at this point, we're about to see the Egyptians literally have the fear of God put in them. Yeah. And that's, and as a result of that, they're going to respect the Hebrews and quickly wish them well out of the country. You know what I mean? And not blame them for the death of their firstborns, which is fascinating. Yeah. You know? So anyway, um, also, I think this is interesting. And we're actually going to talk about 
I think we're going to talk about the not not in this episode, but in another one. But it's interesting how in Revelation chapter eleven, speaking about rebellious Jerusalem and the apostasy right. that's happening at the end of the age and rebellion leading up to the day of the Lord, it calls the great city of Jerusalem a rebellious in spiritually as if it were Egypt or Sodom. And so there is that the opposite of the distinction being made here, where Egypt is being separated from Israel, but in the future as Israel has moved away from the commandments of God and from allegiance to Yahweh and they're, you know, align themselves with Baal, um, they have become spiritually called Egypt, which is like a huge insult, right? Yeah. Toward what God wanted for them originally. And that's just interesting. That That's what calls to mind in, in verse 7 for me as well. So anything else in this chapter that sticks out? Oh, the same for me, that verse. But it also just kind of made me think of um, the verse in Ezekiel that talks about how when he reestablishes his priesthood, that priesthood will teach the people how to distinguish the holy from the yeah. profane. And so I know it's not a, a direct parallel here or anything, but that verse just popped in my mind when we were reading this about Israel being distinguished from Egypt. That's right. It was supposed to be the holy distinguished from the profane. That's right. They were supposed to go out and be a holy nation. <laughs> and at the kingdom come, at the return of the Lord, yeah. the Father's going to reinstate Levites. There's going to be the Melchizedek priesthood, the resurrected saints. We're, we're cohabitating with Yeshua inside the kingdom. Outside the kingdom, where mortal man is, is going to be a need for Levites to be reinstated. We see this in Jeremiah 33, Isaiah 66, and also what she was mentioning, which is in Ezekiel 44, and verse 23, where those people are going to be trained again to distinguish the holy from the profane, right. and therefore teach the law to all the survivors of the nations from the day of the Lord. Um, so, and it's would, a beautiful would we, promise. Would we be better to distinguish that as inside the city versus outside the city or because the whole i mean his kingdom is going to be the kingdom is holy absolutely yeah well the, the whole earth is going to be his kingdom at that point i mean well, absolutely yeah but that's what i'm saying ruling. outside the city the survivors are going right. to be learning right. the law of the lord right in submission to the king who's yeshua yeah right? the our city God, being our high priest. new jerusalem by the way <laughs> right we're talking about the coming of the kingdom of god yeah. so inside the city of the resurrected saints outside the city are the survivors of the day of the lord and they're going to be taught righteousness they're going to be taught to learn the difference between the holy and the profane it's a beautiful promise we have in ezekiel 44 yeah. they're going to be taught that through a new reinstated levitical priesthood at that time which is for the mortal man living outside the city us inside the city will be resurrected, glorified man living inside the city as a part of a royal priesthood, yeah. which has authority over the Levites outside the city. Does that make sense? Yes. Okay. Yeah. All right. <laughs> so I just want to make sure that's clear for people. Um, chapter 12. All right. All right. And guys, if y'all had any, any comments or any thoughts about chapter 11, be sure to put them in the comments below. Yeah, it's a pretty short chapter, so it is. I'll, I'll be interested to see if anyone sees something in there we didn't see. <laughs> Now the Lord said to Moses and Aaron in the land of Egypt, This month shall be the beginning of months for you. It is to be the first month of the year to you. Speak to all the congregation of Israel, saying, On the tenth of this month they are each one to take a lamb for themselves, according to their father's households, a lamb for each household. Now if the household is too small for a lamb, then he, is, then he and his neighbor nearest to his house are to take one according to the number of persons in them, According to what each man should eat, you are to divide the lamb. Your lamb shall be an unblemished male, a year old. You may take it from the sheep or from the goats. You shall keep it until the fourteenth day of the same month. Then the whole assembly of the congregation of Israel is to kill it at twilight. Moreover, they shall take some of the blood and put it on the two doorposts and on the lintel of the houses in which they eat it. They shall eat the flesh that same night, roasted with fire, and they shall eat it with unleavened bread and bitter herbs. Do not eat any of it raw or boiled at all with, with water, but rather roasted with fire, both its head and its legs, along with its entrails. And you shall not leave any of it over until morning, but whatever is left of it until morning you shall burn with fire. Now you shall eat it in this manner, with your loins girded, your sandals on your feet, and your staff in your hand, and you shall eat it in haste. It is the Lord's Passover. For I will go through the land of Egypt on that night, and will strike down all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, both man and beast, and against all the gods of Egypt I will execute judgment. I am the Lord. The blood shall be a sign for you on the houses where you live, and when I see the blood I will pass over you, and no plague will befall you to destroy you when I strike the land of Egypt. Now this day will be a memorial to you, and you shall celebrate it as a feast to the Lord. Throughout your generations you are to celebrate it as a permanent ordinance. 
Seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, but on the first day you shall remove leaven from your houses. For whoever eats anything leavened from the first day until the seventh day, that person shall be cut off from Israel. On the first day you shall have a holy assembly, and another holy assembly on the seventh day. No work at all shall be done on them, except what must be eaten by every person that alone may be prepared by you. You shall also observe the Feast of Unleavened Bread, for on this very day I brought your hosts out of the land of Egypt. Therefore you shall observe this day throughout your generations as a permanent ordinance, until the twenty-first day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses, for whoever day of the month at evening. Seven days there shall be no leaven found in your houses, for whoever eats what is leavened, that person shall be cut off from the congregation of Israel, whether he is an alien or native of the land. You shall not eat anything leavened. In all your dwellings you shall eat unleavened bread. Then Moses called for all the elders of Israel and said to them, Go and take for yourselves lambs according to your families and slay the Passover lamb. You shall take a bunch of hyssop and dip it in the blood which is in the basin and apply some of the blood that is in the basin to the lintel and the two doorposts and none of you shall go outside the door of his house until morning. For the Lord will pass through to smite the Egyptians, and when he sees the blood on the lintel and on the two doorposts, the Lord will pass over the door and will not allow the destroyer to come into your houses to smite you. And you shall observe this event as an ordinance for you and your children forever. When you enter the land which the Lord will give you, as he has promised, you shall observe this right. And when your children say to you, What does this right mean to you? You shall say, It is a Passover sacrifice to the Lord, who passed over the houses of the sons of Israel in Egypt, when he smote the Egyptians but spared our homes. And the people bowed low and worshipped. Then the sons of Israel went and did so, just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron, so they did. Now it came about at midnight that the Lord struck all the firstborn in the land of Egypt, from the firstborn of Pharaoh who sat on his throne to the firstborn of all of the captive who was in the dungeon and all the firstborn of cattle. Pharaoh arose in the night, he and all his servants and all the Egyptians, and there was a great cry in Egypt, for there was no home where there was not someone dead. Then he called for Moses and Aaron at night and said, Rise up, get out from among my people, both you and the sons of Israel, and go, worship the Lord as you have said. Take both your flocks and your herds, as you have said, and go, and bless me also. The Egyptians urged the people to send them out of the land in haste, for they said, We will all be dead. So the people took their dough before it was leavened, with their kneading bowls bound up in the clothes on their shoulders. Now the sons of Israel had done according to the word of Moses, for they had requested from the Egyptians articles of silver and articles of gold and clothing. And the Lord had given the people favor in the sight of the Egyptians, so that they let them have their request. Thus they plundered the Egyptians. Now the sons of Israel journeyed from Ramesses to Sukkoth, about 600,000 men on foot, aside from children. A mixed multitude also went up with them, along with flocks and herds, a very large number of livestock. They baked the dough which they had brought out of Egypt into cakes of unleavened bread, for it had not become leavened, since they were driven out of Egypt and could not delay, for had they prepared any provisions, nor had they prepared any provisions for themselves. Now the time that the sons of Israel lived in Egypt was 430 years, and at the end of 430 years, to the very day, all the hosts of the Lord went out from the land of Egypt. It is a night to be observed for the Lord for having brought them out from the land of Egypt. This night is for the Lord to be observed by all the sons of Israel throughout their generations. The Lord said to Moses and Aaron, This is the ordinance of the Passover. No foreigner is to eat of it, but every man's slave purchased with money after you have circumcised him, then he may eat of it. A sojourner or a hired servant shall not eat of it. It is to be eaten in a single house. You are not to bring forth any of the flesh outside of the house, nor are you to break any bone of it. All the congregation of Israel are to celebrate this. But if a stranger sojourns with you and celebrates the Passover to the Lord, let all his males be circumcised, and then let him come near to celebrate it, and he shall be like a native of the man, but no uncircumcised person may eat of it. The same law shall apply to the native as to the stranger who sojourns among you. Then all the sons of Israel did so. They they did just as the Lord had commanded Moses and Aaron. And on that same day, the Lord brought the sons of Israel out of the land of Egypt by their hosts. Thank you, sweetie. You're welcome. <laughs> That's a longer chapter. Yes. Yeah. Um, right off the bat, first thing that sticks out to me is going to be verse 2. This shall be the beginning of months yes. for you. Um, and so this is in the what we has carried over ever since then as being in what we would call in our, in our country, we would call it the springtime. Mm-hmm. Um, in our modern calendar, it would equate over to around the time of March, early part of April, late, late part of March, um, which was the concept of why you would have you know these other feasts that come up that are conjunction with it that happen during the summer and then at the end of the harvest of the in gathering and sukkot and things like that at the end 
of summer. Because it, it was kind of linked to the agricultural season as well. Yeah. So, sweetie, the question is, when modern-day Israel, which is ruled by a different religion called Judaism, claims that, was the what day is it that they claim it? Uh, what day is not the 9th of Av, but what is it? Um, it's in September, they think is the first day of the year. Um, they call, I'm pretty sure it's trumpets. Uh, actually, I think it's Yom Kippur that they consider the the start of the year i know i was seeing people sharing happy new year right a happy you know hebrew new ago. year a few months ago yeah. around one of the fall feasts so i think yeah. it's i think it's yom kippur but i could be wrong that's that is not passover yeah right is the point yeah right whatever day and calendar they want to bicker over it's not passover and that's this is the whole concept of why aren't we using this yeah. Right? Why aren't we using this instead of what a man said? Oh, no, actually, this is the first of the year. Yeah. And I'm like, wait a minute, guys. Wait, that, that's not... But as we learn, as we do our homework on Judaism, we learn that Judaism does not actually follow Torah, does not follow the scriptures. They actually have their own commentary, right. their own rules they've added over time, and they believe those th- thoughts and ideas, those rules and commentaries, they believe supersede the rules from Yahweh. Right? And so we've got... And it, now, even though, here's the deception part, sweetie, even though they hold up this book as mm-hmm. part of their religious teachings, they actually think they have other teachings that supersede the authority of this book. That's a problem. We actually talked about this a few portions ago, maybe two months ago, we did a breakdown um, yeah. on one of the laws of Judaism as far as eating mil- milk and meat together right. and how they view that and added all these extra rules that's not in actually in um, do. Genesis 18, yeah. right? So that's, you know, you're welcome to go back. I can't remember exactly what the name of that portion was, but um, you're welcome to go back and check that out. Um, I thought you made a little short video I did. of it. No, 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 no. But I made, we did some slides during the portion about the rules from Judaism and how they've added extra to it. And they've got all these culinary laws now about it. And it's just not in the scriptures. They just made up their own thing. So we see that happening even with the calendar as well. And that just, it's, it's crazy to me yeah. that... It's like no one is just paying attention to what it just says right there. That just baffles me. So um, also, interesting, huh? At the beginning of the Passover instructions, he tells the families that you can use a lamb and a goat. Or a goat, yeah. Right? Yeah. If you didn't have enough lambs, you need to use a goat, grab a goat. So is it a hard and fast rule that it's got to be a lamb? Uh, clearly it's not. And actually, when I first noticed this last year when we were keeping Passover, um, we, you know, we looked into the Hebrew and uh, the word lamb itself isn't specific to a sheep. That's right. It could, it, it can be also a young goat. So actually sheep would be the right term if that if that's the animal you're thinking of right. is a lamb. Actually, the correct biblical term would be that's a sheep. And a lamb, you can also call a goat a lamb. It's gets very confusing, but So again, we don't want to argue over semantics, yeah. but I just think it's interesting that it does include in the language that, you know, if you don't have a lamb, you can use a goat as well. So how interesting, though, that when we see John the Baptist point at right. Yeshua and he says, Behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sins of the world, which we're in full agreement with. Yes. Because we absolutely. understand that Yeshua yes. provides atonement for us. <laughs> yes. But when he sees Yeshua and he says, Behold the Lamb of God, he doesn't say, Behold the goat of God. Yeah, or right? the sheep of God, but we all picture a sheep. Isn't that interesting? <laughs> you know, because, and we, we had all readily met, like 1 yeah. Corinthians 5, Paul calls Yeshua our Passover lamb. Mm-hmm. So we all use these analogies of metaphor. But when we dig into the, the terms and the descriptions where the metaphor even came from, that's how we can have the context to understand, oh, that they're just using metaphoric language right. to speak about Yeshua, right? And so they didn't choose the goat, they chose the lamb to speak about him in that metaphor. So it's just, this is, this is how you start to find a bigger picture on how we determine the literal from the figurative. Right. Does that make sense? It's always going back to the context of the term being referenced. And that's the scripture is defining scripture for us. You know? Yeah, there's something that sounds, just sounds better with Passover lamb rather than atonement goat. Right. right. <laughs> Yeshua, our atonement goat. Like it just doesn't quite right. have the same ring to it. <laughs> That's right. Um, one thing I wanted to point out before we move past the calendar is just to remind people 
that Jubilees prophesies that the children of Israel are going to totally lose track of the calendar and we're not really going to be able to figure it out while we're still in the dispersion. And so a lot of people might come into this walk of following the instructions of the Father and a lot of people might get actually worried about trying to figure out the exact right calendar. Guys, you're not going to figure out the exact right calendar because it's part of the punishment that everybody is in being scattered from the land and losing track of all that stuff. Specifically, you mind if I jump in? Sure. Part? Specifically, Jubilee says in chapter 6, the last 10 or 12 verses, that the moon comes in 10 days too early because things have been messed up because of... I don't honestly know how this works, but it's very interesting because it equates the obedience of Israel to the sun and moon not being in their original intended circuits. <clears throat> Therefore, the moon is literally 10 days off. Is it off every single month? Is it off throughout the year? It's been thousands of years since Jubilee's been written. Jubilee's was written at the time of Mount Sinai in the Exodus. So we're not we're not going to know the exact calendar. This is the point of why when Yeshua comes back, this is why he sets up the right calendar. Yeah, so you know Passover we know is foreshadowing all kinds of stuff. And specifically the day of the Lord, the resurrection, that mm-hmm. wrath passing over us. But also, it's it's foreshadowing the resetting of the calendar. That's what I was trying to get to you, is right. to calm you guys down. Look, the Father is looking at our hearts, and our hearts genuinely desire to keep His commandments and obey His feasts and do them to the best of our ability. Mm-hmm. And He is not going to hold against us the fact that, by through no fault of our own, we don't know the exact right calendar right now. So when Yeshua returns, He's going to totally reset the calendar. It'll all be put right, you know, the sun and moon will go the way they're supposed to, and and we'll know. We'll we'll all have that calendar on our walls, I'm sure. So For for what? How many? Over a millennia. I mean, it's been almost not even 2,000 years. But for a long time, we've kept a a calendar that is not the same calendar as Enoch or Jubilees even. Right. I know that those two have, what, 364-day calendars, something like that. But the whole point is we've, we've been off for a long time, and that was even prophesied why that we would be off yeah. through all the apostasy that was happening because I, and I don't know exactly how that works I do think it's interesting though that in modern times the elite of the world are trying to create a fake sun and moon to put up yeah. in the sky <laughs> yeah that's interesting how they're specifically we're talking about people of disobedience mm-hmm. are specifically trying to either mimic or confuse us or do something to do to, to excuse me something to do with the actual circuit of the sun and moon even if they put a replica up there, I don't. I don't exactly know how that works. Yeah. What they're intending to do, if they think that we're going to be just happy with two suns in the sky, I don't get that. But they're actively doing that. It's in. It's in modern, well, well resourced news. You know, articles. Mm-hmm. Anyone can look this up. This isn't some fringe yeah. thing I'm talking about. Um, so how interesting that we're in that time period, guys. Just like we're in the time period, Jubilees 23 also prophesies about how we will start to remember his ways again. Just like in Deuteronomy 30 verse 1, at the end of days, yeah. that we start to remember his, his uh, commandments and cleave to his commandments so that we walk in his ways again. And that's happening. That's the reason yeah. why you're watching this show right now. Yeah. And that we're doing these kind of studies. Because we as believers called to mind the relevance of his commandments and was like, wait a minute. These never went away. Yeah. In fact, Yeshua, <clears throat> Peter, Paul, James, John, they're all telling us we need to keep the commandments as we walk with Christ. And that's what we're starting to do by the millions. And it's growing even more and more mm-hmm. in the modern body of believers. That was prophesied also in Jubilees and Deuteronomy. So I, we, we fully believe that we're in the end days. We don't have a countdown clock, I'm right. sorry. But <laughs> we do think that it, we're definitely you know in the last couple generations of the end days. Yeah. Because all these things are, these types of prophecies are just being blatantly fulfilled before our eyes. It's encouraging. It's fascinating. It's a little anxiety building. But at the same time, that's why we love prophecy. Because the Father gives us his encouragement and his comfort to know that we will have protection in the resurrection to be saved from the day of the Lord. No matter what we may undergo in order to get to that point. Yeah. He's going to resurrect our souls from Sheol, give us incorruptible bodies with hearts that have his commands written on them permanently. We never have to learn them again. We'll have them known instinctively. We'll never fail to do them. We'll be able to be in his house with him and never have to worry about transgressing his commands or his instructions or the concept of righteous living because we'll do it 
by his power. And it's it's amazing promise that we have. So this is why Paul encourages us in 1 Thessalonians 4, verse 18, that we should comfort one another with this promise. Yeah. So I want to comfort everyone listening to us that even though we have certain prophecies that we're fulfilling now, and some of them say, oh my gosh, that means we're in the end times, count it all joy. Count it all joy, guys, because we have a beautiful promise that awaits us of eternal life through Yeshua, our, our Messiah. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, I like because to call it... Because he's created atonement for us. Yeah, I like so, to call it the Deuteronomy 30 awakening, the, the, that's this right. thing that's happening now. I've heard other people come up with names for it, but to me, I'm like, what's Deuteronomy 30? That's right. Yeah. And also, we just... Ultimately, we want to comfort you guys that don't freak out about you know what day you're keeping, which feast, who's keeping this calendar, who's keeping that calendar. If there's a fellowship, uh, a ministry that you follow, and they do a live service on that feast day... Go with the calendar they're keeping for for sure. right now. You know that's what you know. We there's a ministry we like to stream on Shabbats, and you know we'll keep Passover at the same time they do because we like that fellowship. So it's totally fine. I just want everyone to be yes. calm about please, that. Please, no bickering in the comments yeah, about don't, which day. Please, no calendar debates. Yeah, we're I mean, not. We're, we're not. We'll, we'll we're let not you happen, but we won't. <laughs> What's that? I said we're not the ones to argue with about the calendar. Yeah, we, we will not be entertaining in the comments um, any debates on calendars. Yeah. I'm sorry, guys. It's just not the focus. We don't want to jam up the comment section of people that might be trying to learn. We're not going to erase your comments by any means, but we are not. We just may not respond to those yeah. comments. Okay, guys? With all love and respect. Yeah. Um, so, um, also, just keep in mind that if you're not keeping... Like we're trying to... Because we're, we're having this conversation because we're talking about Passover and Unleavened Bread, Okay. So the whole point of this is we want to encourage the people that are watching that if you are keeping one, say at the end of March, you start keeping Passover, but someone else is keeping it a week later or two weeks later, that is no reason for division. That is no reason to call some person of the faith and some person not of the faith. That is no reason for anything that may cause strife amongst your brethren because it's been prophesied that we would lose track of these things. Everyone is doing their best in observance and reverence to the Father to do and keep these things, these these set apart appointed times, as best they can until we're regathered into the land at the resurrection. So we want to deal gently and lovingly with our brethren concerning these appointed times. Um, anyway, that's I just want to stress that. All right. Um, what's interesting? I mean, we've already talked about this whole concept of Passover being symbolic of the day of the Lord itself, right. right? This whole concept of you know the wrath passed over them because they had the blood on the lintels of the door. And this is what we get through the metaphoric blood of the lamb that's over us. Like mm-hmm. clearly we're in Sheol or we're even if we're alive and remain at the coming of the Lord, we don't have blood draped over us by the lamb. So we know that these are metaphoric concepts that through Yeshua's perfect blood, he acquired this priesthood that he could raise us from the dead as he explains to us in John chapter 5 and Revelation 2 so that he can keep and hide us away as Isaiah 26 explains to us during the wrath that happens on the earth. We're hidden away in the new Jerusalem one that happens after the resurrection. You actually did um, a short presentation on all of the symbolism of Passover connected with the day of the Lord. I did. I'm going to flash this up on the screen, guys. 24 parallels to Exodus, the Passover, and the day of the Lord. Okay? And so I actually, it's 24 parallels. If you, if you're just for the People that love good meats and that are nerdy like me, and you want to go through two hours worth of 24 parallels <laughs> between the Exodus Passover and the coming, the second coming of Yeshua, um, that video is up there. You're welcome to check it out. It's on my channel on, on Kingdom and Context. Yeah, it sounds like a lot, but he actually had to shorten the list. <laughs> I did. I had to shorten them. So there's a lot of parallels. So um, anyway, um, also, isn't it interesting that uh, Passover in verse 14, I think it was, that you read... In verse 14, it talks about how it's in a, a per- perpetual ordinance, a yeah. permanent ordinance. Yes. So let me ask you something, sweetie. If the Father says, here's a, a, an appointed time feast that I want you to keep, and I want you to do this in remembrance of this Passover event, okay? And I'm going to call this a per- permanent ordinance or perpetual ordinance throughout your generations. Is there anything in there that said, until Christ comes? I saw nothing that put <laughs> okay. any time qualifier on okay. this. <laughs> All right. So is there anything that said, I want you to keep this ordinance until uh, the temple's built? No, no. I'm pretty sure yeah. they kept it they kept once it they built in the, the temple. temple. <laughs> That's right. Yeah. We see that in Second Chronicles 30. Um, let me see. Is there anything in there that says, I want you to keep this Passover perpetually throughout all your generations until this guy named Paul arrives? 
I saw no such word until in any of these verses. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's perpetual. It's permanent yeah. ordinance, right? We'll be doing it when the kingdom comes. Yeah. Jesus in Luke 22 even talks about doing it again in the kingdom yeah. with us. When it's actually fulfilled, and those are his words. I'll let you look them up. It's in Luke 22 and Matthew 26. So this whole concept here is that even in Ezekiel 45, verse, I think it's 17, mm -hmm. talks about how in the kingdom, people are still both inside and outside the city. They're keeping Passover. Yeah. Okay. So this is something that it's we do it in, in memorial to the Exodus right now. And then people in the future will be doing it in, in memorial to both occasions, both right. to the Exodus in Egypt and also, as uh, Jeremiah 7 talks about, or 23, I think it is, uh, verse 7, talks about how people won't even talk about the Exodus anymore from there because they'll be talking about the first resurrection event at the gathering of the day of the Lord. And so they'll probably be doing Passover as a memorial to that. But the point is, Passover itself is going to be a perpetual ordinance throughout the generations of Israel. So if we believe that we're part of Israel and Israel inherits the kingdom of God, which is the new Jerusalem, that's going to come down through the ferments, down on the ground between the Euphrates and the Nile, and that all the survivors of the, Lord, of, the, of the day of the Lord are brought to the city and taught Torah, which is the terms of the covenant, which is the law that brings them into and grafts them into Israel. All of Israel perpetually throughout your generations should keep this memorial, which is called Passover, including unleavened bread. It's not going away, guys. It's not going away. You mean we're not going to be vegetarians in the kingdom? We're not going to have Passover tofu? <laughs> Uh, so, that's a whole nother video. <laughs> that's a whole nother video. Um, you know, and that's that's one of the challenges we're at right now because we're still doing this part time, and we, you know, our goal is that the father would bring us into a place where we can do this full time. But right now, um, we only have so much time for videos every week, and we do our best to even put out what we can at this point. But in the future, I plan to do an entire video series on the New Jerusalem, which would include all the interaction of the survivors of the day of the Lord living outside the New Jerusalem and how we as resurrected saints will be interacting with them. Because guess what, guys? Everything has been explained to us in this book. Yeah. Specifically in Exodus to Deuteronomy. So all the behavior that we're going to be doing in the kingdom has already been told to us. Yeah. Anyway, but that's a whole other video, guys. <laughs> that's a whole other video. So... Um, anything else, lastly, in chapter 12 before we move on? Uh, I just had to chuckle a little bit when we got to the end and, and Pharaoh was finally like, go, take your children, take your livestock, take everything, get out. Like, it's, you know, um, yeah. he brought it upon himself. Yeah, he so. was brought to rock bottom yeah. at that point. He was definitely brought to his knees. Uh, his pride was brought to its knees. Yeah. And, um, yeah, so he's like, everybody, <laughs> no more yeah. conditions this time, yeah. right? No more caveats. Just yeah. go. Do what you need to do and go. Get out of here. Yeah. Um, <laughs> but we're going to read later that he even yeah, changed his Yeah, even that didn't again. last long. <laughs> yeah. That's wild. That's wild. All right. Um, do you want to pick up 13? Or I, I should read yeah, 13, right? it's your turn. Okay. All right, guys. So we're going to start in chapter 13 and just go through verse 16. Then the Lord spoke to Moses, saying, Sanctify to me every firstborn and first offspring of every womb among the sons of Israel, both of man and beast. It belongs to me. Moses said to the people, Remember this day in which you went out from Egypt, from the house of slavery. For by a powerful hand the Lord brought you out from this place, and nothing leavened shall be eaten. On this day, in the month of Abib, you are to go out, excuse me, you are about to go forth. It shall be when the Lord brings you to the land of the Canaanites, that the Hittite, the Amorite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite, which he swore to your fathers to give you, a land flowing with milk and honey, that you shall observe this rite in this month. For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast of the Lord. Unleavened bread shall be eaten throughout the seven days, and nothing leavened shall be seen among you. Nor shall any leaven be seen among you and all your borders. You shall tell your son on that day, saying, It is because of what the Lord did for me when I came out of Egypt. And it shall serve as a sign to you on your hand and as a reminder on your forehead that the law of the Lord may be in your mouth. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought you out of Egypt." To. Therefore, you shall keep this ordinance at its appointed time from year to year. Now, when the Lord brings you out to the land of the Canaanite, as he swore to you and to your fathers and gives it to you, you shall devote to the Lord the first offspring of every womb and the first offspring of every beast that you own. The males belong to the Lord, but every first offspring of a donkey you shall redeem with a lamb. But if you do not redeem it, then you shall break its neck, and every firstborn of every man among your sons you shall redeem. 
And it shall be when your sons ask you in time to come, saying, What is this? Then you shall say to him, With a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt from the house of slavery. It came about when Pharaoh was stubborn about letting us go that the Lord killed every firstborn in the land of Egypt, both the firstborn of man and the firstborn of beast. Therefore I sacrificed to the Lord the males, the first offspring of every womb, but every firstborn of my sons I redeem. So it shall serve as a sign on your hand and as phylacteries or bands on your forehead. For with a powerful hand the Lord brought us out of Egypt. Okay. So, um, yeah, it's, I, I love the fact that it's actually instructing the fathers, hey, your kids are going to ask about this. Right. And here's what you're to tell them. Yeah. Right? So he just doesn't, he wants to make sure that they're relaying the message properly. I just love that type of thoroughness that we see in Scripture sometimes. You know what I'm saying? He's instilling them with the ability to have an answer, right. to be ready with an answer when there's a question. That's right. <laughs> yeah, and that's... It's just great because obviously, you know, we're going to read later in, um, what is it, Deuteronomy chapter 9, verses 6 through 9, you know, about um, teaching your children all these laws. Right. And so that's that was, you know, kind of the idea as well. Um, anything, what, what stuck out to you in this particular chapter? Um, well, I think a lot of the meat that we have, you know, revolving around this part of the chapter will be in our pairings. Um, but... I do think that unleavened bread, you know, it can seem, if you don't have a concept of the resurrection, unleavened bread can seem like this really random set of instructions to eat this interesting cracker-like thing for a week and not have any leaven in your house. And of course, we see later on um, in the scriptures that um, some things such as sin and the hypocrisy of the Pharisees are likened to leaven. And so a lot of people, you know, think about this spiritual application of, oh, get the sin out of your life, get the leaven out. But there is a literal fulfillment of this. When we are resurrected, those new bodies we received, they're going to be perfectly free of sin. That's right. Because we'll have his law written directly on our our hearts. We won't ever transgress it. So it's it's interesting to me that there's a literal application here that kind of you don't really see if you don't quite grasp the resurrection. So... In modern, in modern teachings, we're always encouraged to get sin out of our life, yeah. right? This is part of discipleship. You're growing in the knowledge of God through the Spirit of God that's put in your heart through faith in Yeshua, our Messiah, um, upon your conversion. And then you learn His Word and grow in your obedience right. to God, right? Learning the commandments and, and being faithful in those. This is how we get sin out of our life on a continual basis. But this specific instruction for getting leaven out of your borders even, not just your house, but even out of your borders. So this was something for them to remember when they got into the land that they were to get the leaven, which, you know, there's all these interesting conversations about what they considered leaven back then as far as what they leavened their actual bread with, and it wasn't just normal yeast. Right. So there's that's a whole different conversation we may save for a special video. But the whole idea here is that they were to get the leaven not just out of their house, but out of the borders. And how is this symbolic to the kingdom come? That's exactly what happens at the resurrection. Our bodies, there's no leaven in it. There's no sin in it, right? And there's no sin in the kingdom itself. Within the city of the New Jerusalem, there's, it's a place of purity. It's a place of righteousness, right? Where the Father's instructions are always being kept. So I just want, I love this. Even back then, they're being told these applications so that they're to keep the kingdom in mind because that's... I mean, I just think there's a lot there. There's so much foreshadowing. And, you know, I know Passover is coming up in a month or two, depending on which calendar you're on. Um, And for some more detailed information, if you have, like, general questions, if this is your first time keeping Passover, Sean and I are not going to have the time to do any kind of instructional video for that. Um, But there is one other ministry that Sean and I enjoy viewing on YouTube, and they are Messianic Torah Observant Israel, MTOI. Sure, a lot of you know who that is. Um, Steve has a really great couple of, I think it's like two or three part uh, series called Passover Q&A, where he actually goes through all those step-by-step things that we just don't really have time to get into. And what Sean was just talking about with this, you know, what was considered leaven back then, a lot of us might think, you know, our first time doing this, we need to go to the Jewish websites and see what they do to get leaven out of their house. And we might think we need to go and find every single thing in our house that has yeast in it and throw it away. 
Um, and that's not quite how it goes. So if you want some more detailed information on you know, how to prepare for Passover, um, that is one series I have found that I found extremely helpful the first year that I kept Passover. And mm-hmm. it actually took a lot of pressure off. <laughs> that's kind of the whole point of why she's yeah. mentioning this, guys, yes. because this, this idea that the Father's instructions are not burdensome. Yeah. Okay? And this is why earlier in the broadcast we brought up how Judaism is notorious through modern day cultural, uh, they've made Judaism synonymous with the Jews, right? right? Which is, anyway, it's a whole different conversation, but it's it's become an identity for them mm-hmm. as far as their religion. But the teachings of Judaism add to right. the basic instructions given to us by the Father <laughs> in Scripture. So the idea of getting leaven out of your house to observe Passover for seven days is not difficult at all. Right. It's not. And so this is why we're encouraging to go to a source who explains the simplicity of it just because they're, you know, just in case you want all your detailed questions answered, like she said, unfortunately at this point in her life, we don't have time to make that video. Yeah. So yeah, go check that out. Passover Q&A by MTOI Ministries. Yeah. You can Google it or YouTube it. Um, also, verse 6 and 7, sweetie, I really wanted to point out because I think it's fascinating. Okay. Um, here in 13.6, where it says, For seven days you shall eat unleavened bread, and on the seventh day there shall be a feast to the Lord. Oh, yes. Okay? So in our pairings here in a few minutes, we're actually going to go into Jubilees, and we're going to get a definition to that term, feast of the Lord, and the history of where unleavened bread even came from. Because this is not the first time that unleavened bread was practiced. Right. As this, usual, as usual, as, as we've been finding. If you've watched any of our kingdom portions <laughs> yeah. in the last two or three months, you've seen that we there are this dispensational idea that the law was only given to the children of Israel coming out of the Exodus, and no one had those instructions beforehand. Pure nonsense, yeah. right? That is not in Scripture, and all the other books that other countries have considered Scripture throughout mm-hmm. time, and all the apocryphal books and everything. Th- this is not at all accurate, right? That was a modern idea that came about just in the last 120, 130 years, okay? So this idea that the law was only given at Sinai is not accurate. It's been around since man was around. That's the point. That's why it's instructions for living. So as long as Adam was breathing, he had instructions (laughs) on how to live righteously, right? And this whole concept of God's commandments, God's instructions, he's just telling us his ways. You remember the scripture where he says, my ways are higher than your ways, right? That's what he's talking about. Yeah. This commandment is light. This commandment is truth. Perfect law of Lord. James calls it the law of liberty. So this whole concept is the Father Yahweh is telling us, this is my behavior, and I want you to emulate my behavior. And he says, I know it's going to be difficult because you're corrupted and you're flawed, but I'm asking you to emulate it because it'll create life and peace and blessing for you. And when you mess up, I'm giving you a priesthood to make atonement. Okay. So that's the whole, you know, in in a little simplified nutshell, that's the idea of his commandments. And we have this concept here of these feasts, which are called, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread is, is one of the big three that Exodus chapter, 20, uh, chapter 23 is, it introduces and tells and reminds all the children of Israel, hey guys, this is one of the three big feasts for you guys every year that I want you to be faithful and keep every year. And so this is why I just want to encourage people to stick with us. We're going to be jumping in this pairing that's going to explain where the Feast of Unleavened Bread came from and some history of Passover itself, which is fascinating, guys. Fascinating. Yeah, so, yeah something we hadn't caught before. Yeah, it's just, yeah, it's fascinating. Um, I just love digging into the Word. It's every, You just find new stuff all the time. So... All right. Anything else you want to talk about real quick about 13? Um, just in chat in uh, verse 16, it says, So it shall serve as a sign on your hand and phylacteries on your forehead. For with a powerful hand, Yahweh brought us out of Egypt. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, so is that literal or is that figurative? Doesn't, doesn't the word in there actually use a simile? They shall serve as phylacteries? <laughs> That's right. Because this is another example of you know, the religion of Judaism where they right. have taken that and I'm pretty sure that word phylacteries is, that's is, referring specifically to the, the band the across things your forehead. That they were. Yeah. 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 So that Well, they've turned that into an actual box, a right. little Saturn box right. that they put on your forehead. Instead, yeah. the original definition was just a band across your forehead, like we're in a headband. Yeah. You know? So I just think that it's definitely because the whole point would be, it's like, uh, it reminds me of that little band that that Aaron would put across his forehead as a high priest, right. which symbolized, you know, his authority and his, right. it's a, the whole concept is about your obedience to God. Right. So. Yeah. Because with your hands, it's symbolic of the things you're doing. Right. And with your forehead, it's symbolic of, you know, what your thoughts are on. Right. What's on the, the front of, of your mind. Yeah. Right? So What's they the weren't walking around, 
you know, Edward Torah hands, right. you know, with Torah scrolls taped to their hands. Like it, it's clearly figurative. That's right. So That's right. I just yeah. wanted to point that out. <laughs> <laughs> good, good catch. Ed, Edward Torah hands. I, I should make that, I should make that a thing. <laughs> Um, all right, so let's look here at our first pairing. This is going to be in the extra biblical book of Jubilees. And we're going to be in chapter 17. We're going to be reading verses 15 through 18 for those following along. So here in verse 15, it says, And it came to pass in the seventh week, in the first year thereof, in the first month in this Jubilee, on the twelfth of this month, there were voices in heaven regarding Abraham, and that he was faithful, and that all he told him, and that he loved the Lord, and that in every affliction he was faithful. And the prince Mestima came and said before God, Behold, Abraham loves Isaac his son, and he delights in him above all else, all things else. Bid him offer him as a burnt offering on the altar, and you will see if he will do this command. And you will know if he is faithful in everything wherein you do try him. And the Lord knew that Abraham was faithful in all his afflictions. For he had tried him through his country and with famine, and had tried him with the wealth of kings, and had tried him again through his wife when she was torn from him, and with circumcision. And he had tried him through Ishmael and Hagar, his maidservant, when he sent them away. And in everything wherein he had tried him, he was found faithful. And his soul was not impatient. He was not slow to act, for he was faithful and a lover of the Lord. Okay, the reason why we're going we're gonna to jump into Jubilees 18 as well, real quick, because it, it matches up to this. But the reason why we wanted to just people to see this, because this is the context leading into Jubilees 18, and it tells us when this moment of, of the, you know, Mastima, who is, is the Satan character, comes before the Lord to test, just like in this Job concept, right, of yeah. testing Job, Satan is trying to do this with Abraham in a couple spots in his life, and he's trying to say, hey, you know, see if, see if he'll sacrifice Isaac, right, which is against the Father's law. Right, so this is, I mean, that we did a whole video on that. Yeah. Actually, it's called Yeshua, our eternal high priest. I'm going to flash the, uh, the thumbnail up here. You guys can go check out um, how we actually talk about Genesis 20, uh, 22 and Isaac and the whole thing pertaining to Yeshua's sacrifice on the cross. So you guys are welcome to check that out as well. Um, but this whole concept is in verse 15 where it says it was this occurred in the first month on the 12th day of the first month. Right. So Passover is on the 14th <coughs> of the first month. Mm -hmm. The Feast of Unleavened Bread begins on the 15th of the first month. Okay? So if we go over to Jubilees chapter 18, and we're going to read from verses 15 through 19, we see the conclusion of this story, because the inter in between these verses is the moment where he takes Isaac up to the mountain, and we know that story, right? But let's look at the conclusion here after we have the context of when this takes place. Because remember... It took a three-day journey, yeah. right, up to this mountain, which was Mount Moriah, um, which we actually is Mount Zion later yeah. on in, in the establishment of the nation of Jerusalem, which is very, very significant. But in this moment, we now have the, the after, after the story is over kind of concept. And it says in verse 15, By myself I have sworn and says the Lord, because you, has, you have done this thing, and you have not withheld your son, your beloved son, from me, that in blessing I will bless you. And in multiplying, I will multiply your seed as the stars of heaven and as the sand which is on the seashore. And your seed shall inherit the cities of its enemies. And your seed shall all nations of the earth be blessed. Because you have obeyed my voice, and I have shown to you, excuse me, and I have shown to all that you are faithful to me in all that I have said unto you. So go in peace. And Abraham went to his young men, and they arose and went together to Beersheba. And Abraham dwelt by the well of Oath, and he celebrated this festival every year, seven days with joy, and he called it the festival of the Lord, according to the seven days during which he went and returned in peace. And accordingly, it has been ordained and written in the heavenly tablets regarding Israel and its seed that they should observe this festival seven days with the joy of festival. Love it. Isn't that amazing, guys? Yeah. So in case you're, just, just as a quick summary, in case you didn't follow, this this moment with Isaac took place in the first month, okay, from the 12th to the 15th, which is the time of the Passover, yeah. right? Yeah, because on the 10th day is when they're supposed to bring, supposed to get bring the, the lamb. Supposed to get to bring the lamb, yeah. that's right. So Isaac was, you know, now this isn't exactly following on the 14th, we're not right. saying that. Right. But we're saying the time period of, the, of any kind of harm befalling Abraham's firstborn passed over him, yeah. right, because of the Lord. So no harm befell Isaac, and then he celebrated this feast every year as a result of the time period it took to go and return, seven days, and he calls it the Feast of the Lord, just like we read in Exodus 13, verse 6. This is the Feast of Unleavened Bread, 
that they're celebrating. Yeah. How amazing is yeah. that? And so the thing we noticed is he's not keeping Passover itself That's because right. Passover itself that when they say eat the Passover, it's specifically referring to that sheep or goat that's killed on that 14th of the that's first right. month. And that seems to have been instituted right on, you know, when they due, came out of Egypt. Yeah, due to the Egyptians and the circumstances right. of the children of right. Israel leaving Egypt. We're just saying that the symbolism is right. already being foreshadowed yeah. back in the days of Abraham. <clears throat> and he celebrated the Feast of Unleavened Bread right. because of this event with Isaac. And that's what's being instituted as a national feast for the children of Israel and reminded to them in Exodus chapter 13 and 12 and 13. So I just think it's beautiful because, again, this is just more evidence that these instructions that are considered the commandments of God were not new to them. Right. Right. Just like we talked last week about how all the priests were already at the base of the mountain. They're already coming out of Egypt with them. And we see the scriptural evidence for that. Jubilees 32, Levi gets the priesthood and his descendants are with him in Goshen that whole time, right? So this whole concept is that none of the the, the laws of the Lord, there may be extra details given because of the right. circumstances right. of what they were doing as they were coming out of Egypt and they were about to go and establish a nationhood. Right. So there's some little extra circumstantial details. But the big meat of moral instruction and keeping feasts to the Lord and things like this, these were already established to mankind being passed down you know, all from Abraham, he instituted what? Sukkot, yeah. Shavuot, and the Feast of Unleavened Bread. Yeah. And many of them had to do with things that were going on in his life. It's just, it's beautiful, right? And we already knew that he was keeping the commandments, statutes, precepts, and, and ordinances of God that was passed down to him from Noah. Yeah. Right? And that's what we read in Jubilees chapter 7. So it's just, it's beautiful that the Father has, this is why on our context tree, we call it the eternal Torah. So it's one of the branches on the tree on the channel here because this is his instructions for living. Do not go away as long as you're alive. Yeah. <laughs> that's, that's the whole concept of about his ways living righteously and we're instructed to emulate those ways. It's amazing. Yeah, it's almost like he could have foreseen that someday someone might think that there was a time that these laws weren't supposed to apply. Because he uses these words eternal, perpetual, through all your generations over and over and over through the whole first five books. So it's almost like he might have, you know, thought at some point people are going to say, oh, no, there was an expiration date on these. <laughs> I know. It's, it's wild. He's definitely, like like Chuck Mesler would say, he uh, foresaw signal interruption. Yes. <laughs> and he knew how to communicate the message so that people wouldn't be confused down yeah. the line. We just have to take these words seriously. Right. And take them for what they say in the context that they're given let scripture define itself and you start to realize that there's a lot of doctrines of men that are not in scripture that we've been taught in previous generations. Yeah. So we just want to lovingly and patiently weed through those doctrines yeah. of men and get to the simplicity of the scriptures. Yeah. So anyway, um, our next pairing guys that we want to go through is going to be uh, out of our, the Brihada Shah, also called the New Testament. It's going to be in the book of John. We're going to be looking at chapter 8 and then verses 12 through 20 for those of you following along. Yeah, and just to remind you guys, we mentioned to you before Luke 22, if you want to go check that chapter out, um, Jesus actually says that Passover is fulfilled in the kingdom. So this is another doctrine of men that we've all inherited, that Passover was fulfilled at the cross. And while there was definite, you know, there was definite symbolism going on there, the feast itself isn't fulfilled until he actually brings his kingdom and that wrath passes over us via the resurrection. So right, he actually the, says it in Luke. That's right. <laughs> because the day of the Lord is a huge right. Passover right. for the righteous, for the yeah. dead in Christ and those who are alive and remain. Because his wrath is coming for the wicked who are on the earth. Right. Okay, so. We're going to be in John chapter 8, and this is in verses 12 through 20. Thank you. All right. Then Jesus again spoke to them, saying, I am the light of the world. He who follows me will walk, will not walk in the darkness, but will have the light of life. So the Pharisees said to him, You are testifying about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered and said to them, Even if I testify about myself, my testimony is true, for I know where I came from and where I am going, but you do not know where I come from or where I am going. You judge according to the flesh. I am not judging anyone. But even if I do judge, my judgment is true, for I am not alone in it, but I am the Father who sent me. Even in your law it has been written that the testimony of two men is true. I am he who testifies about myself, and the Father who sent me testifies about me. So they were saying to him, Where is your father? 
Jesus answered, You know neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know the father also. These words he spoke in the treasury as he taught in the temple, and no one seized him because his hour had not yet come. Thank you, sweetie. Yeah. Um, all right. So what sticks out to you about that? Well, obviously, it's, this is hearkening back to the Israelites having light in that darkness. That's right. So we definitely wanted to draw on the symbolism there because it's just beautiful symbolism. I just love it. I it used is. to be in such darkness and knowing his light now, it's just, yeah, I definitely had a false light. Yeah. <laughs> and he talk, he does talk about that as well. Because she was the light of the world. Yeah. Um, <laughs> and also, I love it how he reminds them that the testimony of two are true, yes. right? And he says, and I don't testify about myself alone, but the father does as well. Hmm. Where's the, where's the father testifying <laughs> how of is, him? How, okay, guys, there, there's a common teaching, right, uh, that's been running around that the Yahweh of the Old Testament came in the flesh and just called himself Jesus. Yeah. We just want to lovingly remind folks that the scriptures say in abundance of places that's not the case and that the scriptures prophesied that Yeshua would come, Yeshua, who's the son yeah. of Yahweh, would come in the flesh as the Messiah. We see the pre existent nature of Yeshua in verses in it's Enoch 48, verses 1 through 6, the entire chapter of Enoch 62. It's also in the book of Isaiah, chapter 49, verses 1 through 5, that the Messiah, who's referenced as the Son of Man in the book of Enoch and, and also the book of Daniel, and Jesus himself calls himself the Son of Man, right? That he was. A, Pre-existent, just as Jesus said in John 17, verses 3 through 5, right? That he existed with the Father before the creation was made, okay? And that all things were made through him, by him, and for him. And that he was destined and prophesied to be the one to come as our Messiah, to rule in the agency of his Father as God, King, Savior, Redeemer, High Priest, right? So this is the whole point of Yeshua being prophesied to come. This is why 1 John chapters 4 and 5 stress so heavily that if you're rejecting the Son of God, right? Not Jesus in the flesh, but that the Son came, just like Jesus says, I was sent here and I go back to my Father, right? So Jesus, it, it tells us in many different places that he came from the Father and he's going back to the Father. Here he's saying, you don't know my Father, because yeah. if you did, you know me, <laughs> right? So he, this, whole, this whole concept here is he's telling him that he came from the Father and that's what the prophets prophesied, yeah. okay? Enoch, Isaiah, he comes from the Father, Psalm chapter 2, yeah. right? He's prophesied to be the king of Zion, to be the high priest, Zechariah chapter 6, verses 11 through 15, Psalm 110, verses 1 through 4, to have this role over us as, as uh, our Messiah who, who embodies all these different characters in the agency of his Father. It's never been prophesied in Scripture that Yahweh would come in the flesh, okay? Enoch chapter uh, 105 Verses 1 through 2 says that Yahweh, well, it says the Lord of Spirits, which is Yahweh, the, the creator of all, the Almighty, and his Son would come down and dwell with man on the earth, right? We see this also in Revelation 21, right? The Lamb and the Almighty God are the light of the New Jerusalem, right? In Revelation 22, they've come to dwell on the earth with mankind. So it's, it's, it's not a Trinitarian idea, okay? It's just a simple concept of Yahweh is the Almighty, he had a Son, and together they created all things, right? Right? Because, like Jesus is saying here, there is a principle that, that Yahweh goes by, which is establishing something by a testimony of two or three witnesses. Okay? And this is something that we see in the Torah, right? In, the, in was it Deuteronomy, I believe? Um, yeah. I don't know the exact verse off the top of my head right now, but this is a principle that the Father goes by. So it would only make sense that he would do even creating all things by that same principle, right? And this is also, in our opinion, why we see in Genesis 1, in verse 26, where he's saying, let us make man in our mm -hmm. image, yeah. okay? We do not believe that angels had any part of creating mankind. Um, we believe that the Son, as Jesus himself said, was preexistent with Yahweh before the world was created, and all things were made by him, through him, and for him. And so that he is the firstborn of all creation. He is the Son who comes from the Father. So he's not co-equal to the Father. He is the Son of the Father. Yeah. And the, that's why even in John chapter 20, Jesus calls him, that calls Yahweh his God. And in John chapter 10, he says that Yahweh is greater than him. Mm -hmm. Right? John chapter 17, he calls Yahweh the one true God. So I'm just saying there's this dichotomy from the Messiah words himself that the Father Yahweh is the greatest of all. That's why it's called the Almighty. That's what we talked about a couple weeks ago, right? Yeah. Remember in Exodus chapter 3 and 4 when Moses in the burning bush moment where he's talking to the angel in the burning bush and the angel reminds him 
that the father referred to himself as the Almighty of the patriarchs before him, but now he was going to reveal his his Yahweh, his yod heh name to Moses. And that was the first time that anyone got it. That's why in the book of Enoch, we see him referenced as the Lord of Spirits and not Yahweh. And, and in Genesis, we see Abraham and Isaac and all of them referring to him as the Almighty and not Yahweh. So there's a distinction here of who Yahweh is, who his son was, is, and was prophesied to be before creation, how he was hidden away in those verses I referenced earlier from Enoch 48, verses 1 through 6, Enoch 62, the whole chapter, and then also Isaiah 49, verses 1 through 5, only to be revealed to the elect and righteous at his first coming, right? And then he's all the prophecies of his second coming later, right? Because we already get in the prophets about his death and how he's betrayed and everything and all the events that go down there. And then we get prophecies of his second coming, okay? So this is the whole concept. And when he comes the second time, he's coming with the kingdom that he's been given. All authority in heaven and earth was given to him because he earned it through obedience to the Father's will to become our king and high priest. And he comes with the kingdom, right? And in this kingdom is the paradise of God, is the Father's house, which is why Jesus in John chapter 14 says, In my Father's house are many rooms, and I go to prepare a place for you. And if it were not so, I would not tell you, right? So there's a, there's a father-son relationship happening here. And, it's, and the, the son never claimed to be equal to the father, okay, as far as power and authority. He's given the authority of the, of the father, but he's never, this Trinitarian idea that he's co-equal to the father and he's co-eternal. Yeah, co-equal, co-eternal. That is not in scripture, guys. That is not anywhere in scripture. Yeah. Only, only upon his appointed role that was prophesied of him is he given authority in heaven and earth. But even then in 1 Corinthians 15, verse 23 through 25, he gives that authority back to right. the Father at the end of the story. Yeah, yeah, co-equal and co-eternal, that's whether you want to whitewash it with their one or not, that's two most high creator gods. Right, and that's not what Scripture and says. And that's not what Scripture says. That's yeah. why we, we are not Trinitarians, yeah. nor are we Arians, or because you. what I just explained is not Arianism. Right. Just in case people out there are knee-jerking, because I know some are. Or Unitarian, or yeah, it's modalist, not Unitarian. Or whatever these yeah. words are that people say, well, are you this, or are you that? I'm like, I don't know. I no, came no, no, into no. this a few years ago, and well, I mod- just believe yeah. the scriptures. <laughs> Modalism just saying that the Father is, is still the same being, but he just shows up in different formats. Oh, like he's okay. just showing up. Yeah, it's basically, not it's, me. it's just a variation of a hypostatic union. Yeah. But it's, okay. The point is, it's all coming from Catholic <laughs> dogma, and it's not in Scripture. And this is the whole point. All these prophecies I just gave you to research on your own talks about how the Son was preexistent before the world began, but He's the Son. That means He came forth from His Father at some point. When did that point happen? I don't know. Yeah. It doesn't say. Yeah. But we know He's not. There's not two fathers up there, right? This isn't my two dads. Right. Okay. This is one Father and one Son who was prophesied to become the Messiah, sent into the world, born of flesh, born through Mary. This is what First John tells us that if you reject the Son, came then you don't know the Father, right? Right. So we just want to encourage people to really study the Word about this. We've actually done an entire series. I'm going to flash up um, uh, the playlist here on the screen as well as you know just the, the playlist that you can see in my YouTube channel because I've tried to dissect these ideas with five <clears throat> different videos with great depth. If you haven't already seen those, I strongly encourage you to look at that because that's what Jesus is talking about right here is that dichotomy, and it's all in Scripture. It just takes us researching it and looking at it and putting putting the pieces together you know what i mean so i've taken the time to do that for you i've simplified it made videos or put scriptures on the screen for you to test and that's the the play of the son of the father so i encourage you to check it out um the next parent that we want to look at is john 12 mm-hmm. i'm going to jump into that real quick so it's going to be verses 34 through 36 this is just really short we just want to add to what we were talking about yeah. and verse 34 says And where have you laid him? And they said to him, I'm sorry, that's chapter 11. Let me go into chapter 12. And so in verse 34 says, The crowd then answered him, We have heard out of the law that the Christ is to remain forever. And how can you say the Son of Man must be lifted up? Who is this Son of Man? So Jesus said to him, excuse me, Jesus said to them, For a little while longer the light is among you. Walk while you have the light, so that darkness will not overtake you. He who walks in the darkness does not know where he goes. While you have the light, believe in the light, so that you may become sons of light. These things Jesus spoke, and he went away and hid himself from them. All right. Love it. Sons of the light. Yeah, that's our promise, guys. That we'll be at Revelation 22, verse 4, illuminated by God. Yeah. Illuminated at the resurrection, given our incorruptible bodies. I've jokingly referred to ourselves as little walking light brights, right? We're going to be illuminated by God. We see this at the transfiguration. Mm-hmm. We also see foreshadowing of this, Moses coming down from Mount Sinai. Mm-hmm. 
it's not in full totality, but it was like a little foreshadow. His face glowed for a while. He had to put on the veil. But we see this promise at the resurrection is that we will be made like the angels and our bodies will apparently emanate light in some regard. Yeah. Um, this is why he's even talking about why we're called sons of the light and we're walking in the light of Yeshua, which is his ways, which is what Psalm 119 refers yeah. to. Uh, Proverbs chapter 6, I think it's verse 23, 24, that the Father's word is light mm -hmm. to us. Okay, and that's his, his commandments. Um, but I, I love it here that it's mentioning this, that the people said, we have heard out of the law that the Christ is, when he comes, is to remain. Yeah. So guys, this is where we've talked about in previous episodes how the Pharisees were teaching them all kinds of stuff that was not right. We even see Jesus address this so many different places. Yeah. He, we would say statements like, well, you've heard it said, mm -hmm. right? Or you've heard it taught. <clears throat> But I tell you, right? And then Jesus goes in to actually give the commandment from the Torah, yeah. right? And also, like, in the conversation with Nicodemus in John 3, he's reprimanding Nicodemus for not understanding the resurrection, which is explained in the Torah. Right. Because he's like, you're a teacher of Israel, but you don't know this stuff? How is that? Right? Because these guys did not have sound doctrine because it was an infiltration of the priesthood, the teachers of the law, the Pharisees were corrupting everything with Judaism, and people were being very, very confused. The sheep did not have a good shepherd, Right? They were like, they were being led astray with all this mixing of doctrine. And so Yeshua, that's why the Pharisees hated him. He'd come right. in with sound doctrine, preaching the gospel of the kingdom yeah. of God. And they didn't want that happening because they were nefarious and preaching. They were brood of vipers. They were intentionally preaching and leading the people astray. And, and Yeshua, you know, addressed them for that in Matthew 23 pretty strongly. And so, um, which is why they eventually killed him. Yeah. Because he yeah. was preaching sound doctrine of the gospel, the kingdom of God, and all the component details of it. And they didn't want that happening because they were trying to suppress that in their unrighteousness. So that's, uh, I just love it that we're seeing a little glimpse of that, that the people themselves are confused, yeah. right? Because there are prophecies about the Christ when he returns. He does reign forever, right? That's all the second coming prophecies. But there's a ton of other prophecies about his first coming and about how he must be lifted up and about how he would be killed and betrayed and murdered. You know what I'm saying? So like... But they weren't being taught that. Right. That's why they, they were really trying to ask, are you really the one to come? You know what I'm saying? When even in, um, remember the other conversation, was it in John chapter 7 between the Pharisees? I'm, I'm, I'm missing it in my mind right now, but it's the one where they said, I thought the, Fer the Messiah was supposed to come from Bethlehem. Right. Because they thought Jesus was from Nazareth. Did they know he was born in Bethlehem? Right. We remember, Clearly not. Yeah. Remember at his birth, Herod tried to persecute all the Hebrew boys and try to kill him. Joseph and Mary had to flee to Egypt for a couple years, right? So everyone around him, they didn't, then he come, they come back and apparently they moved to Nazareth. So even though he fulfilled prophecy to be born in Bethlehem, like Micah talks about, everyone that knew him as he grew up just thought he was a Nazarene from Nazareth, <clears throat> right. right? So they're confused because there's an intentional suppression by the leaders and religious leaders of that day because they knew he had shown up, right? Because they knew the prophecy from, from 2 Ezra chapter 7 that was supposed to be a 400-year prophecy that he would show up at the end of that 400 years. And they knew the time was up. We even have the three wise men show up to Herod and say, hey, we heard that the Messiah's yeah. born. Where is he? We'd like to say, we'd like to pay homage to him. And I'm sure Herod was just like, you know, peeing his pants at that moment because they were trying to suppress the fact that he was there. And then when they realized, oh, this is the guy, they kill him, right? But it was all prophesied. And that's, and that's why even the people were being led astray. So I just love it that um, he has to address... Um, I feel bad for the people, right? Because, right. I mean, we know a lot of people believed on him because of the signs and the miracles that yeah. he was doing. And because he, as, you know, Matthew chapter 5 and other places say, he spoke with authority when he spoke, right? And he taught the gospel of the kingdom of God, which is an encouraging message. So he was winning the people over at a very rapid rate, right? Because there was nothing but love and healing and miracles emanating from him. But he that was suppressed with his murder on the cross, right? So that's where, um, you know... <laughs> now I say murder because that was he was unjustly killed, mm -hmm. but we know that he led himself to the cross. He, he willingly laid down his life. We know that. So um, anyway, I just think it's fascinating to see because we we are teaching people on this channel, and we run into that stuff all the time. How people have say, "Well, I thought it says this," right? And then you start to really ask them, "Can you show me where it says that?" Just like the conversation we were having that led here, where does it actually say Yahweh came in the flesh? Right. Okay, so I know a lot of people say immediately and i'm gonna and i'm gonna stop harping on this right after this statement i know a lot of people say well see it says in isaiah 9 6 that that the messiah will have the government be on his shoulders and he'll be called wonderful counselor everlasting father see right there it says that yahweh is coming in the flesh to be the messiah 
No, it doesn't. The word father is in Genesis, was it 45, 10, where Joseph was called a father to Egypt because he was made a ruler over Egypt. Mm -hmm. We see the same thing in Isaiah chapter 22. So remember, Isaiah 9, 6, the same guy also wrote chapter 22, where another guy who was destined to become the king of Israel was called a father to the people of Israel once he became king. This is a common term of authority that was given to rulers and kings from a Hebraic mindset, as you would call him a king or a father. Same thing is spoken about Messiah, who is the son of Yahweh that was destined to come throughout all the prophecies and become the king of Zion, right? That's the whole, that's the whole idea. Isaiah 9, 6 is not a problem at all. What's up, sweetie? Um, two things I wanted to touch on that you mentioned um, before we move on is Yeshua saying, you've heard it said, but now I say. So a lot of times what we run into is people think that what he's doing there is saying, you've heard that the law says, right. but I say, right. no, he's talking about the bad teachings that, because the, these people, look, we are the most blessed generation in all of history to have the access to the word that we have. You have to remember that the people that Yeshua is dealing with that were being taught by the Pharisees, that was the only place they were able to be fed the word is at the synagogues where the Pharisees were supposed to be teaching them. They were not teaching them sound doctrine. They were not teaching them the law. And so what Yeshua was doing was saying that you've, this is what you've been taught, but this is what the, the word actually says. Um, naturally, that triggered the Pharisees, mm -hmm. as you said. Another thing I want to point out um, is that Jesus did not condemn the flock for right. having bad shepherds. He condemned the shepherds for being bad shepherds. So I just want everyone to remember that the world will know we are his disciples by our love for That's each right. other. And it is not our place to judge anyone in a church that is being you know, given bad doctrine. It is not our place to say that they're not of the faith, that they're not in covenant, that they're not our brothers and sisters. All of us were in those churches before we started to come out and realized there was a little bit more to this. And everyone is at a different place in their walk. So you will find on our channel, Sean and I don't alienate um, Christians in the churches. We want them to want to watch these teachings and to fellowship with us and learn the Bible with us. And we don't want anyone feeling like they're not a part of his the body of Messiah based on the bad teachings they're getting That's right. in, in their respective churches. So right. I just wanted to point out our Messiah did not condemn the people for having blind guides. He condemned the guides. That's so. right. Good point. I just want to say that. Absolutely. Amen. That is our heart. We want to reach, just because we want to reach us before we came to this yeah. point, right? <laughs> those people that were like us, that are yeah. like us right now, uh, excuse me, that those people that right now <laughs> are like who we used to be, yeah. right? We want to reach those people uh, because they also just didn't have the pieces put together right. for them, right? And that's that's our goal with this channel yeah. is just to, to reach those who just have blind guides right now. And even even the blind guides, baby. That's why yes, I'm I'm trying yeah. to put together the docu series of yeah. tough questions for pastors, because we understand they learned it from somebody right, too. Right. See what I'm saying? So it's been a generational thing, and and I just you know just like Jesus was willing to talk to the Pharisees and Sadducees, and some of them believed in him and became believers and followed the way. Um, we we believe and pray that we can reach pastors and leaders and teachers right. in modern church uh, as well, just like that. So, all right, our next pairing that we want to look at is going to be in the prophets. And this is uh, in the book of Isaiah, it's chapter 31. Um, do you want me to read this or would you like? You go ahead. Okay. Yeah, we're going to read chapter 31, guys. Or excuse me, chapter 30, verses 1 through 33. I'm saying this completely wrong. I'm so sorry, guys. <laughs> <laughs> I'm sorry. So th this is, I said it right the first time. It is chapter 31. It says, Woe to those who go down to Egypt for help and rely on horses and trust in chariots because they are many and in horsemen because they are strong. But they do not look to the Holy One of Israel nor seek the Lord. Yet he also is wise and will bring disaster and does not retract his words, but will arise against the house of evildoers and against the help of the workers of iniquity. Now the Egyptians are men and not God. Their horses are flesh and not spirit. So the Lord will stretch out his hand and he who helps will stumble and he who is helped will fall. And all of them will come to an end together. For thus says the Lord to me, As the lion or the young lion growls over his prey, against which a band of shepherds is called out, and he will not be terrified at their voice, nor disturbed at their noise, so will the Lord of hosts come down to wage war on Mount Zion and its hill. 
Like flying birds, so the Lord of hosts will protect Jerusalem. He will protect and deliver it. He will pass over and rescue it. Return to him from whom you have deeply affected, O sons of Israel. For in that day every man will cast away his silver idols and his gold idols, which your sinful hands have made for you as a sin. And the Assyrian will fall by a sword not of man, and a sword not of man will devour him. So he will not escape the sword, and his young men will become forced laborers. His rock will pass away because of panic. His princes will be terrified at the standard, declares the Lord, whose fire is in Zion and whose furnace is in Jerusalem. Amen. I love it. So we get this wonderful prophecy about the return of the Lord, and he tells us specifically in verse 5, he will protect right. and deliver it. He will pass over and rescue it. Okay? So this whole concept, as we were explaining earlier, that this what we're seeing in the Exodus is this Passover is foreshadowing the day of the Lord, which is why Jesus would even make that statement in Luke 22, that it's fulfilled when the kingdom comes, that Passover itself, because Passover is just one huge foreshadowing of this massive worldwide event that's going to happen on the day of the Lord. And we as believers, resurrected at the last trumpet, will be passed over. We will be protected Taken, as Matthew 13 says, the wheat taken into the barn of the Lord, right? We're taken to the new Jerusalem. We're protected while indignation passes mm -hmm. us. And the, the, you know, the Lord comes out of his place with fire and indignation yeah. and takes out the wicked on the land below at the Battle of Armageddon and throughout the entire region that's been promised to Abraham in Genesis 13 and 15. So this whole concept here is that um, Isaiah is just reminding them that in this moment, he's because at this point in history, um, the the is, uh, northern house of Israel had tried to make an alliance with Egypt because Assyria was threatening to invade them, and so they were instead of trusting the Lord, they were trying to trust in Egypt's strength and power and horse and military might. And so it's just a unique concept, like we talked about, I think two weeks ago, how every time that Israel went into apostasy, they kept trying to fall back to Egypt. Right? We see that we're going to see that in the book of Exodus and Numbers coming up. But we also see that in the prophets during the days of their established nationhood in the in, in the land of Judea, right? Uh, that they would go into rebellion. Re they would leave, like it says, oh, deeply, oh, sons who deeply have defected from the Lord in verse 6. And he's trying to tell them to return to him because he would protect them. But they weren't. They were trying to rely on Egypt to save them. And that, that didn't work out well for them at yeah. all. So it's because Assyria came in and scattered them, burned them, and, you know, did horrible things. So... Um, the next pairing we want to read real quick is going to be in Isaiah chapter 60, verses 1 through 5. Do you want this one or do you want me to take it? I can go ahead and finish this. All right. One. So in Isaiah 60, it's just the first five verses, but this one is a fun one. All right. Arise, shine, for your light has come, and the glory of the Lord has risen upon you. For behold, darkness will cover the earth, and deep darkness the peoples. But the Lord will rise upon you, and his glory will appear upon you. Nations will come to your light, and kings to the brightness of your rising. Lift up your eyes round about and see. They all gather together. They come to you. Your sons will come from afar, and your daughters will be carried in, their, in the arms. Then you will see and be radiant, and your heart will thrill and rejoice, because the abundance of the sea will be turned to you. The wealth of the nations will come to you. Amen. <sighs> love it <laughs> love it so just as israel in the days of exodus during the ninth plague were a light to the egyptians even though they were in darkness right they were becoming out they were they were being made a distinction of at that point right in, in very literal physical ways yeah so <clears throat> when the kingdom comes this new jerusalem which is going to be 1500 miles tall and have the where it says there's no sun and moon inside of Revelation 21, uh, verses, I think it's 20 or 19 through 23, where it talks about there's no sun and moon in there in Jerusalem because the Lamb is its lamp, right? And so it's illuminated by the glory of God. So this thing is just, I don't know exactly what that looks like yeah. or how that works, but the sun and moon will still be outside the new Jerusalem doing their thing in the, in the firmament above as they're intended to. That's Jeremiah 33. That's never going to stop. But inside the city itself, this 1,500 square miles, um, it's illuminated by the glory of God and the Lamb itself, and that's how it's a light to all the nations around it, right? Because of its yeah. height, you'll be able to see it from anywhere across the circle of the earth, because we don't live on a ball. Yeah. So this is a beautiful promise that we get, that it is literally a place of purity, of mm -hmm. holiness, and anything outside might be something that's learning how to get away from the idea of being profane into the idea of becoming holy. 
So this will be a literal and metaphoric and spiritual light to the nations. Yeah. It's amazing. Yeah, it's I love amazing. It. He is the father of lights. Which is why in John chapter 12, he called us sons of the light. Yeah. Because we're sons of the resurrection, Luke chapter 20, chapter 20, who will be taken into the new Jerusalem. So I just, it's beautiful, guys. It's a wonderful promise. The kingdom to come is the gospel, the kingdom of God. And we just encourage you guys um, to study out these matters as the scriptures we've provided for you on screen. Um, because the, the Exodus, excuse, well, just the first five books in the Bible are just chocked full of the kingdom behavior and kingdom foreshadowing. Um, I mean, I don't think people realize just how much so it is. Yeah. All the behavior that's given to the Israelites in the in the Torah, in Exodus through Deuteronomy, is the behavior that you and I will be doing in the kingdom come. Just think about that throughout this week as as we, you know, as you turn off this video, right? Just think about that for two seconds. Yeah. That behavior which the Father called righteousness which we are practicing right now, which he promises that behavior will be put on our hearts by him in Deuteronomy 30, verses 5 through 8. So we will do it, Jeremiah 31, verses 31 through 34. We'll do it forever and instinctively, and we'll be in his house with him. That behavior was given to them and shown to them in full totality in Exodus through Deuteronomy. And that is how we will behave throughout the kingdom for the millennial reign and forevermore, yeah. right? This is how we will have the righteousness of Christ put on us. Yeah. Right, which is what um, Paul explains in Romans chapter ten, verses one through ten. So I, I just want to encourage you guys this this concept called the Torah, of the instructions of God that are given to us for our behavior and righteousness and living and interacting with people and how we worship Him and all these things like that. This this is all of it's been laid out for us. All of it, how we're going to behave in our resurrection bodies. And so I hope that encourages you because it definitely encourages me. Yeah. We literally are been told how we're going to behave later, and I just love it. Yeah. Because it does nothing but bring life, health, peace, and prosperity to everything involved. And um, I just, it, man, it's a beautiful, beautiful message. And I guess what I'm really trying to get at that I hope people grasp and take away from this is the Torah, it's, the instructions from God itself is the vehicle and the behavior once that we see fulfilled when the fulfillment of the gospel of the kingdom of God happens, it's a central, it's the same message from, from Genesis to Revelation from start to finish. And yeah. only men in the past hundred or more years have tried to convince us that, that it's not that way, right? That Jesus somehow changed things. And that suddenly all the behavior that Jesus was so obedient and selfless in doing as he obeyed the Father, suddenly we don't have to do that. That's a lie, guys. It's a straight up lie. Because that's why we're told that it might be our Messiah who kept the commandments. Because that is behavior we'll be doing in the kingdom. It's just, it's beautiful. I get, I get excited. Clearly, you can tell. I get excited. Yeah, we're not going to live in his house and not follow his rules. That's right. So that's what I like to remind people is, you know, these are the rules of his house. And this is the constitution of his kingdom. And why would we ever consider that to be a bad thing? So, um... It's Isn't only I mean? because, yeah, it's just because people have convinced people otherwise. Yeah. And people aren't reading their books. So we encourage you to read your Bible this, you know, this week. And, um, yeah, I, I've got nothing else. I just appreciate you for joining us. Like, share, and subscribe. Put any comments or questions you have down below. And also share this to your social medias if it blessed you. That way you can get the word out to other people. Yeah, and as always, I just want to, if you made it all the way to the end, I just want to thank you for watching the whole thing, and please leave any comments, anything you saw in the in the last couple chapters that we forgot to ask you about, and I, just to remind everybody, our heart here is just to teach you guys the word in a way that you can actually go and effectively teach it to others. We want you to be ready with an answer, whether you're talking to a Christian in the church or your unbelieving neighbor next door, or a coworker at work who's curious about your little tassels on your clothes. We want you to be able to answer all the questions that naturally arise from believer and unbeliever alike. And to do that, you just gotta keep everything in context because context creates comprehension. And our goal and our heart here is just for everyone to be able to comprehend his word because mm -hmm. that's what he means for us to do. He, he doesn't want his word to be a mystery to us and he doesn't want us to have to rely on on bad teachings, you know, uh, and bad blind guys to try and understand these things. So I just really, we really appreciate you guys. We mm -hmm. really love you. <laughs> Thank you for joining us here, guys. Shabbat Shalom. And we hope to see you here next week on Kingdom Portions. Bye, guys. Have a good week. See you next time.